Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome everybody to this, our third session in data-driven software engineering. And it's my great pleasure to welcome again a duo now from Microsoft. Our first speaker is from the product team. He's Aid Miller, Dr. Aid Miller. He got his doctorate from the same university as I did, Southampton, yay. And um, he is going to, he is the development manager for a group in Microsoft called Patterns and Practices. And maybe he'll be telling you a little bit about what they do. And he has led many uh, projects inside Patterns and Practices, and he goes around and uh, talks about them, and you're in for an exciting ride with his talk. I'm going to introduce all the speakers now so that we have a seamless uh, transfer over because our second speaker has, in fact, um, morphed himself into three speakers, and he is Tom Ball, who is a principal researcher in Microsoft Research. He also has another distinction, which I'm sure you all know, which is that he's our highest cited uh, researcher in Microsoft Research, which I rather love as an <laughs> intro. <laughs> well, according to one of the citation records, good for you, Tom. And um, he comes from Wisconsin-Madison, if you're counting PhDs. So who's, uh, who else is Wisconsin-Madison? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's going to speak along with Sebastian Burkhart here in the front and Madden Musafati, Farthi, and they're going to... Uh, also talk about concurrency. And this particular session we've put on specially has a slightly educational flavor. So I hope you're all going to enjoy that. Over to you, Aid. OK. Can everyone hear me all right? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, it's, actually, it's actually not only did Judith and I get, uh, get awarded degrees from the same university, she was actually one of the people that that indirectly taught me to program. It was, it was her Pascal book that uh, was, uh, was actually one of the few pieces of, of formal training in, in writing software that I've actually ever had. Um, so that's, uh, that's a little bit about me, and it also tells you a little bit about why I like books, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, so she said, I'm the development manager at Patterns and Practices. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what my team does, because you're, you're probably not familiar with it. Um, really, our goal is to try and help developers at their desks become more successful with the Microsoft platform. Microsoft ships an enormous amount of stuff. I like to liken it to this enormous field full of Lego bricks. Um, and, and customers don't care about the Lego bricks. They care about their business problem and the thing they're trying to solve. And as an architect or a senior developer in one of those companies, typically someone comes to you and says, I need you to solve this problem. And your job is to pick the right bricks and assemble them to come up with a solution. And that's really what my group tries to help people do. Um, and as part of that, we've started to look at how we can help um, programmers address the, the new challenges involved with parallelism. So really what I'd like to cover is, is why would we, is, is these things. Why, why would we care about parallelism? Why suddenly has my group turned around and decided this is an important thing? Um, you know, where would we start? Um, some of the things that we've come up with and, and a few conclusions. So why should we care? I, this is kind of a, a cool graph that um, uh, Herb Sutter came up with for us. Um, but, you know, if you've only actually got to look at the marketing literature, which is, is kind of funny. If you go and look at the marketing literature for processors 10 years ago, it was clocks this and clocks that. It was my, my processor has more gigahertz than your processor. If you look at it today, it's all about how many cores your processor has, right? No one's touting clock speeds anymore. And you can actually see why, because if you look at that blue line, it's flat. There's, there's no news to be had there. There's nothing the marketing department can sell anymore. Um, but Moore's law continues, and uh, if you look at the green line, we're still getting more and more transistors. We've got more and more features per chip. So, well, what do you do with all those, those potential features 
Well, it turns out you end up adding more cores. And if you look at um, the processors that are around today, the processor I have at home has four cores, eight hardware threads. Um, Intel have just announced a 48 core experimental chip that I know people are starting to play with. Um, clearly, there's going to be a lot more cores around, and they're not going to be running faster, which means that you know, programmers today can't do the trick that I did when I was doing my PhD, which is my, my supervisor came to me and said, how can we make this run faster? And I said, I'll go on holiday for six months. And he was, why, why would you do that? I said, well, we'll just get faster hardware in six months. It'll run faster, and I won't have to do anything, and neither will you. What this has been termed is the end of the free lunch. I don't know whether any of you have come across this term. This is something that Herb Sutter coined. He wrote an interesting article in Dr. Dobbs's journal about this. And the notion is that we're no longer going to get speed up for free. Right? Clock speeds aren't going to keep going faster. Um, and in fact, software becomes the gating factor. Right? It's not about, you know, it, it's couched in terms of, well, we get more cores, it's all hardware. But actually, we have to write code that, that takes advantage of that. So that's really why, why my team is interested in this, because lots of today's developers are going to have to deal with this in terms of the software they write today for today's hardware and tomorrow for tomorrow's inherently more parallel hardware. Um, and this is happening a lot faster than you might think. You know, as I say, Intel have just announced a 48-way a, a way chip. So where do you start with all this? You know, if, if you talk to developers, they say things like this. You know, it's for the experts. Um, and in fact, you hear really quite senior programmers saying, well, it's for the experts. Um, and I, I don't want to do it. It's going to make my code more complicated. It's going to make it harder to understand. I'm likely to introduce really bad bugs. Um, I'll, I'll punt on this entirely. We'll just live with slower code. So we want to help them succeed in, in writing code in this new parallel world. So we sort of sat back and thought, well, what, what could we do to help? And in fact, there's, there's already been some work in this area. Um, there's been some work done out of a number of places around this, this thing called our pattern language, or OPL. Um, there's, uh, there's been at least one book written. This is the, the most notable one, Patterns of Parallel Progressing by, um, by Mattson, Sanders, and Massingill. Um, and there's also been a, a number of white papers and blogs, and, and goodness knows what else. We looked at an awful lot of, of sort of different things there. Um, largely because there seems to be a body of work um, that explains how to use patterns to, to make your life easier here. Um, and then there's also, uh, and I'm going to show you a, a few things here, um, there's also a new set of tools and frameworks that have come out in Visual Studio 2010. Um, the Task Parallel Library, which we'll be looking into in a little bit of detail. Um, there's also some equivalent libraries for C++ for those of you who are um, not focused on managed code. Um, there's also some tooling around parallel debugging and parallel profiling to, um, to help here. So really what those tools do is they raise the level of abstraction. You can start thinking about tasks as opposed to actually individually thinking about what's going on on individual threads in your application, which is normally where people sort of start to trip up. And then that makes it, in turn makes it easier to apply this work that's been done on patterns because you're less down in the plumbing of your application. You can start to think about it at a more high level. And what I want to do to sort of illustrate this approach um, is I'd like to sort of talk, talk you a little bit through um, an one of the examples that we wrote um, in, in this book that we've written um, called the Adatum Dashboard. And that's really designed to be um, a, a sort of a real, in inverted commas, application. So really what it does is it, it's a, a financial analysis application. The, the code for this you can download from uh, CodePlex, which is Microsoft's um, shared source site. So if you want to actually go look at this, play around with it, um, you, can, you can do that and show it to your students and what have you. So the scenario we're talking about here is really a, a sort of a financial modeling application. The reason we picked this is we were trying to come up with something that would resonate with these real developers at their desktops. Um, and really what it does is it loads chunks of historical data um, and, and current data from the NASDAQ, the 
uh, New York Stock Exchange, the Fed. Um, and then it, it goes through and it normalizes them. It does some analysis. It creates some models and it compares them. Right? And you can find people doing this in you know, real world trading environments today. We haven't written a full blown model. Really, what we wanted to do was show the, the inherent sort of parallelism there. And what we wanted to do was say, well, if you're doing that, if that's the sort of problem you've got, how do I apply parallelism to this in a sensible way? Um, so we tried to come up with um, a way of thinking about parallelism um, in a sort of a, a, a sort of a more a, a more formal sense. The typical sort of approach to that previous slide, how do I parallelize this, is for the developer to go in and they say, well, I, I know that creating models is expensive. I know that my app spends a lot of time creating models, right? So I'll, I'll go in and I'll, I'll just go and optimize that bit of the code. So I'll find some, I don't know, some loops in there and I'll try and write parallel loops, right? The, the problem with that is that even if creating your models is, is half your, the, the time you're spending in, in actually doing all of this work, um, you, you run into this, this Amdahl, Amdahl's law effect, which if, if, you've, if, half your application, if half your time in your application is spent doing one thing and you make that twice as fast, you've only really made an overall gain of 20% because the other half of your app is still as slow as it was before. So what we've tried to do with these patterns is push people into thinking about their app overall. Um, and this ties in with some of the work that the, the OPL people and the people at Berkeley notably have done on this, right? where it, it's not about just going in and saying, oh, well, here's a for loop. Let's see if we can write this for loop in parallel. Oh, well, that's made it a bit faster. Let's go find another for loop and do this. It's about getting people to think about um, their application at a sort of a higher level. And we identified a number of key patterns. There are many more patterns than this. We tried to pick some of the key ones to, to highlight to, to programmers um, to make them successful. So we picked these scenarios largely based on, um, on how, how, how often they occur. Um, and they're, they're things that you know, are probably very familiar to you, like parallel tasks or parallel loops. And actually, if you look at the frameworks that are out there today, for instance, parallel loops, OpenMP is, is very much about parallel loops. You know, there are whole frameworks that have been written around parallel loops. And what this, what this flowchart does is it really allows you to go through and, and say, well, what are the constraints on my particular application, and how does it fit into this chart? And if we go back to the, um, the Adatum dashboard scenario, Oops. You'll see that it actually fits in down here. And I'm going to go through and show you some code. Because the other important thing about what we're doing here is that the, the task parallel library, the C sharp library that ships with, with Visual Studio 2010, actually makes this much easier to think about in terms of actually implementing it. But each one of these sort of different um, layers has, has a set of constraints associated with it. Go forward. So for example, if you talk about data parallelism, right, which is this, this idea of, of pushing chunks of data out onto um, different workers, you have to start thinking about things like, well, are my data chunks too big or too small? Right? If I have some chunks that are too small, um, I'm likely to spend an awful lot of time assigning jobs to things, but not very much time actually doing any work. So I spend more time managing my process than I do actually doing any real work. Do I have any de dependencies between these chunks? That makes a big difference, right? If I have one of the key things you have to understand when you're writing parallel code is understanding the dependencies in, in your code, right? The minute you start sharing things, right? Your mother told you that sharing was good. Well, in a parallel world, sharing is not good, right? Sharing is, sharing is probably going to end you and end up with, with, more, with more trouble. Um, you know, task parallelism, again, there are these trade-offs you make. If you have too many tasks, you're likely to spend your whole time managing a huge pool of threads. If you have too few, well, you're probably not going to occupy all the cores that you've got in your machine. These are all things that, that programmers have to understand. And, and if you talk to, I, th I think the number that I heard was sort of, it was about 5% of programmers are actually really into this whole multi-threaded thing and, and sort of would describe themselves as reasonably confident at doing it. That's a really, really small number when you think that actually 95% of the machines on people's desktops now 
That's a number I just made up, so don't quote me on that. But it, most people have multi-core machines on their desktops, and yet only 5% of the people actually programming for those machines understand how to use the second core. And then there's this idea of control and data flow. And if you think back to the Adatum sample I just showed you, it's, it's very much about control and data flow. I've got these, these things that have to happen in the right order in many cases. A has to happen before B can happen. Um, in some cases, I have no dependencies. Or in other cases, well, I might have things that actually have to happen at the same time. For example, they're both trying to compute on the same data. I might also have external constraints, too, which is something people often forget. Right? If I'm trying to write a file in order, that's an external constraint. At some point, I must serialize everything and reordering it to put it in the file if I did it out of order in parallel. And then there are these overall forces, which if you, if you look at these, you'll see that actually they're kind of mutually exclusive in some ways. Typically, if you look at code that's been optimized to be really, really efficient, uh, it's no longer simple, and it certainly doesn't uh, run on wide varieties of hardware, right? People start to gain efficiency by optimizing around different pieces of hardware. Um, when we look at some of the things in the Task Parallel Library, you'll see it tries to abstract all of that away. It tries to basically do the best job on any hardware you give it. In the, it looks at potential parallelism. It doesn't, it doesn't promote the idea of... of of writing code against one particular hardware set. It promotes the idea of just writing code and having the runtime exploit the available parallelism. So I just want to go back to this scenario again. And it looks very much like a control, a control flow problem, right? Some of these things have to happen before others. Some of them, you've got two columns here where clearly it really doesn't matter what happens in either column in uh, at any one time, provided they, they both ultimately complete. And in the book, this is covered by what we call the futures pattern. These are graphics taken from the book, by the way. We, we tried to get a whole lot of nice graphics made up. Um, but essentially, what, what we're doing here is showing you a, um, a, a, an acyclic graph, which has also been called the task graph pattern. What I just want to do now is show you a little bit of code. I've not got a lot of time, but what I do want to do is show you how you do this in the Task Parallel Library. Because as I said, one of the things that we're trying to um, sort of get across here is that we've raised the level of abstraction. I, I don't know whether any of you uh, are really familiar with C Sharp or even just C++ threading, but creating a, creating a task graph like that would actually be quite a lot of work, right, if you were going to do it from scratch. Um, I, I know one of my colleagues actually has a much simpler example than this, and he has the, the before and after sort of approach. Here's, here's how you do it by creating a pool of your own threads and then scheduling work onto the threads and figuring out what the threads are doing and all this sort of stuff. And it's, you know, it's pages and pages of code, and it, it scares me, and it probably scares a lot of other people. And then you look at it using something like the Task Parallel Library, and I'm not saying there aren't other frameworks. There are lots of sort of frameworks coming out now that do this sort of stuff. Um, but this is, this is the one that's, um, um, that we're, we're shipping with, with 2010. If you want to do this sort of thing using the task parallel library, it actually becomes pretty straightforward. Right? So I essentially can use the, the factory start new method. How many of you here are actually familiar with, with C Sharp? Anybody? Nobody? Oh, OK, quite a few people. Excellent. Um, because as I say, this, this, the, it uses the, this code uses some of the more advanced features of C-sharp, so it can look a little bit ab abstruse. But really what we're trying to do here is I can say factory start new, and then I've basically got a lambda expression here. I can say, well, here's where I want to load my New York Stock Exchange data. And I can do the same thing. I'm, I'm saying this is long running. There are a bunch of options I can provide. And this basically gives a hint to the scheduler that, well, this task may be around for a little while. Don't get too worried. Um, if you think it's not doing anything, it really is. Everything's OK. Um, and then when I want to merge that data, I can create another task. 
But I can say here, I can say factory continue when all. And then I can pass it a, an array of the tasks I want it to wait for. So I'm going to create this second task that will only run when it sees the result, when it sees the results of the first two tasks. And I'm actually going to pass it the results of those tasks, which is what I'm doing here. So I, I can very easily build up this graph, and I can provide it with interesting options around, um, for instance, you'll see at the top here, I've created this cancellation token source. So when I've shown this to people who weren't C-sharp developers who were familiar with quite a few of the other sort of libraries around for doing this. One of the things they said is, one of the interesting things you've done here is you, you've placed a lot of emphasis on being able to cancel things while they're running and being able to handle errors from things, right? So one of the problems you have when you, you create your own, you know, your roll your own thread pool uh, implementation of this is, well, what happens if one of these threads throws, right? Or what happens if I want to cancel the whole thing? I have to write a whole lot of additional code to shut stuff down. Um, but it turns out to be relatively straightforward to do this with the, the task parallel library. And it basically, the, 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 the sample goes on and it essentially creates a graph using this same sort of pattern. And there are these interesting trade-offs that you have to be aware of when you're doing this around smaller tasks, larger tasks. Um, the, the, this particular pattern doesn't really inherently address adding more and more cores. If you look at that graph, you'll have seen most of the time there, there are only a couple of things running at once, right? Some of the other patterns, for instance, when we look at loop parallelism, you'll see that actually you can add more cores there, and the underlying task parallel library runtime will just take care of it for you. So there's a number of ways you could kind of partition this thing, and we actually saw you could do some coarse grain parallelization. You can see I had far too much time to play with PowerPoint. But what you can do to address this, the fact that the graph itself doesn't have enough things going on, is you can go in and you can look at some of these things that are now running within the graph in parallel, and you can further parallelize them. So we said, you know, create, model, analyze. Some of these things were actually, you know, had inherent parallelism in that we could go and exploit as well. Um, so when I talk about this, I normally try and go through this example and sort of pull out some, some other places you could do this sort of parallelism. What I wanted to do for you today was just talk to you about some of these patterns that we've identified and show you some of the example code associated with them. So two of the obvious patterns that um, people talk about are parallel loops. I mentioned there are already frameworks that have been around for a while, like OpenMP for, for C developers that, that, that address this, and parallel aggregation, which is typically this sort of reduction uh, operation as, as popularized by, by Google's MapReduce. So parallel loops are really very common, right? Um, really, the, 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 thing that, the thing that's key to, to parallel loops is that there's no communication among the steps. So each of these things is independent. And sure enough, you can do this sort of thing in the TPL too, right? It's a... It's an obvious thing to go support. Um, so instead of using the, the normal sort of four i equals zero to number of steps, you can say parallel for zero to number of steps. And then you can provide it with this lambda here, which is actually doing the work, right? You'll notice that the, 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 the implication here is that do work of i has no dependencies on do work of any other value of i. And they could execute in any order. Uh, and this is really important because this is something that lots of people don't get at first. We spent a sort of a lot of time going back and forth as to how much to emphasize this when we, when we were writing um, the book. Um, and you see people on forums all the time saying, well, I, I, you know, I went through and I changed my code and now it just doesn't work. In fact, I had someone 
from a, a consultancy come to me and say that this was the best piece of business generation he'd seen in a long time. He figured he was going to spend the next five years going back through people's code where they'd done a search and replace on Parallel 4 and actually making it right for them, uh, which was distressing, but um, it seemed to make him very happy. So, of course, a lot of the time you do have dependencies. What are you going to do then, right? Um, again, the naive thing to do, and you see a lot of people doing this, is they stick a whole lot of locks in there to make sure that whatever is being shared is not being violated. Well, actually, first they don't stick any locks in there, and they figure out it's broken, and then they stick a bunch of locks in there, and then, then they ask, well, why is it now slower, right? Because in the pathological case, you've actually just written the world's most complicated serial loop. And again, the guys that wrote the, the task parallel library, um, this is parallel for each. We have parallel for, we have parallel for each. Um, the people that wrote the task parallel library realized that this was a, a key thing to go solve. Um, so again, I can pass in, I can have my parallel for each. I can pass it in a sequence of things. I can pass it in this. Um, this lambda that lets me set an, an, an initial result. And then I can, I can loop over all my, um, my values. And they're each returning this normalized value plus the partial result. And then at the end, I can do this reduction step where I take the local sum and I add it to the final sum. You'll notice there is actually a lock around that, right? I'm now all updating one variable, but I'm only doing it at the end of every block. So the idea is that it, I'm taking less locks. It's going to be quicker. Um, and there'll be less contention, so it should scale better. Right? I can now have more cores. So as I mentioned before, the TPL um, tries to express potential parallelism, so it tries to scale for you. And this is an example where if you write reasonable code and you understand your dependencies, the task parallel library will kind of do some of the heavy lifting for you. So if I run this on... Uh, this is only a two-core laptop, but if I take it home and run it on my four-core machine, four, eight cores, depending on how you're counting cores, um, you'll, you'll find it will scale automatically. I won't have to do anything to this code, right? And that's one of the things that the, uh, the task parallel library, they spent a lot of time, for instance, with, uh, with how they, how they uh, implemented the scheduler to try and make, uh, make that happen for you. So again, these are ways where they've, they've raised the level of abstraction so you can start thinking just about these patterns um, rather than how, did my, how do I cancel my thread pull. And then the other, one of the other obvious things that you can go do is just parallel tasks. You know, create me a task here, create me a task there. Um, let's, ha let's have, you know, and then wait, wait for them all to finish. So the, the canonical example of that is probably the, um, the master worker pattern, right? You know, I create a whole bunch of workers, I leave them sitting there, I portion out work to them, and then when they're all finished, I'm kind of done. Again, there are some things you kind of have to think about here, which we, we try and talk about. They're obviously fairly... Um, application specific. Um, one of the things we actually thought of doing when we wrote the book was, well, could we produce a big reference implementation that covers all the, you know, all the parallel things? Uh, we came to the conclusion that, no, you can't. It's not really like producing, say, a reference implementation for a web application. Um, lots, of, lots of these things you do in, in, in parallel code are, are not generic enough to just be in one, one implementation. And then you want to balance the, uh, the workload across your workers. And this is actually something that the, the Task Parallel Library does as well. It's something we cover in quite a lot of detail in the book um, in terms of how you can, um, how, how their internal scheduler works and how you can work with it rather than trying to fight it, which would be a bad idea. So we talked a little bit about sharing state. Um, don't share, share read-only data, understand how data is isolated and synchronized. 
I don't want to run over, so I, I was going to show you one more pattern, but we'll, we'll come back. We'll, 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 it's, it's on the deck if you want to look at it. Um, so really, what are, the, what are the conclusions here? Well, really, the, con the conclusion that I, I came to was that, um, you know, how are you going to be successful with this stuff? Well, frameworks and runtimes make a huge difference. They get you out of doing all that plumbing at the low level. And that actually has benefits on multiple occasions. It benefits you when you're writing the code, but it also benefits you in terms of um, testing the code because, as I said, the Task Parallel Library and, and these other frameworks um, are designed to largely let you run on different pieces of hardware without you having to you know, be hardware specific. So you don't have to then say, well, you know, it runs OK on a two-core machine. Does it run on this four-core machine or that four-core machine? All that stuff's been abstracted away from you. And it also makes your code cleaner, which means that maintaining it later on is a, is a lower cost exercise, right? If anyone's ever tried to uh, port or maintain large pieces of legacy parallel code, you'll, you'll probably understand what I'm saying. It's, it's normally fight quite scary. Um, tools. So there are some other things I haven't had a chance to show you, like the parallel, uh, the parallel debugging view, the parallel profiler inside of Visual Studio 2010. Um, those are also key to just visualizing what's going on inside your app. Again, you know, uh, most programmers are very, very familiar with dealing with single-threaded code. Um, actually just visualizing what's going on when multiple things are running at once, especially when the timing on them isn't particularly well synchronized, is pretty hard. And then guidance. And really what I've been showing you today is some of the guidance that we're going to be delivering. Um, I mean, that's really, if you go talk to anyone on my team, that's the thing they will harp on about um, at great length, is this notion of guidance. And we typically think of guidance as written guidance uh, on how to be successful. And normally it comes with some examples and some little frameworks and this sort of stuff. But it's really about guidance. And what we picked out here was just patterns. We said these are some, these are some places where you can get people to, uh, what I like to call, falling into the pit of success, right? You know, they will guide you into doing the right things. And along with the patterns come examples of actually how to use that. All the sort of code and stuff I showed you today is part of those examples that come with the book. Um, and and this, is, this is what we've, we've actually been writing. Um, the idea is to, to help people be more successful with the, the new parallel features in 2010. Um, you can actually go download the preliminary draft off of parallelpatterns.coplex.com today. Um, that's all there. It's not all formatted. It doesn't look as beautiful as the final one will with all the graphics and everything. But the raw text is, is all there. It's just going through editing and formatting now. Essentially, this is what it covers. It covers these six key patterns. I showed you two or three of them today. Um, it also has some material on adapting existing object-oriented patterns. It has some guidance on how to use the debugging and profiling tools and a technology overview. Um, and really, I just wanted to sort of talk to you today and make you aware of what we've been doing there um, and see if you had any feedback on, on what we've, we've been doing. I don't know whether we want to do questions at the end and have Tom come up and do his piece or whether... Hmm? Yeah. Uh, uh, so if anyone has any questions they want to ask now, I've got a couple of minutes and then we'll, um, we'll move on. Uh, so there's a question there from the gentleman in the blue shirt. I found myself, sorry, in, in your code examples, I found myself doing a sort of uh, mental reverse engineering to somehow get back from that code to the much simpler diagrams, and it was not simple. Um, and it made me think that, that somehow going from these patterns, which are kind of elegant, and sort of forcing them down into the syntax of this programming language had a big cost and obfuscation. And I'm wondering if you've thought about, you know, either adding a language layer to make that easier or in, in some other way helping bridge that gap. So I haven't, no, in that I, I, I sort of sit between two or three different worlds, right? I didn't actually write those, those language layers. There is some work going on at Microsoft, for instance, if you look at, for instance, things like the Axum project. Um, is, is some work that's been going on to look at ways to further add abstraction and, and bridge the gap. 
Um, really what the, did, Tom, did you want to chime in? I, I might just say that uh, F sharp has a notion of workflow where it's, I think you can do these tasks at sort of a language level and, and, the, and you don't have as much maybe boilerplate, you, right? Um, the inference is doing more for you and, and, and also it's, uh, it's, it's got some language uh, constructs for doing the workflows. Does that sort of, I, it's not a very good answer to your question, but does that sort of give not, you the, okay. Not all the languages are sort of at the same level of uh, uh, expressivity, I guess, and conciseness. Probably, probably got time for one more question. I don't want to eat into Tom's time, so. Question the gentleman in the, the pale blue shirt there. This is just a follow up. Uh, a number of new languages have appeared in the last few years uh, at uh, facilitating parallel programming languages like uh, X10, Chapel, Fortress, UPC. Do you have any comparison of what kind of performance one would get using your library versus using uh, one of these other languages? No, I don't. Um, I know there's been some work, for instance, to port some of the parallel dwarves to um, some of these frameworks. I don't know whether there's been any, been any performance testing going on there, right? But I, I mean, I know, uh, and I wouldn't be the person to, to go do that. I, I think in answer, the, the other answer to your question is in terms of the task parallel library, I mean, obviously, if you want down to the metal absolute best performance, I would say that you probably still, you know, I mean, you, you probably still want to go to a, a lower level of abstraction. But the, the, the thing that we're trying to do here is provide uh, a gateway into parallelism for people who already have large quantities of, of, of C-sharp code, right? Does, does that sort of, I, I mean, it's, I don't have any, uh, any data on that, but I'm not sure that um, you would necessarily want to compare those two things anyway, per se. I think I've run out of time, but I'll be hanging around afterwards if people want to ask me other questions. Um, but I should hand it over to Tom. Okay. Well, while Tom's coming up, if I could just follow up on this question. Um, we've, since this is meant to be a discussion, so I, I can ask you, have those languages a actually come out? Because I've been watching for Fortress and haven't sort of seen it emerge. I had a student who ran some programs in X10, Java, and C++, uh, just looking at uh, performance. And um, I, I kind of like looking at real data, and uh, the data were revealing. I could talk about these later, but um, in, in the high-performance computing, in the scientific computing arena, performance, of course, is extremely important, especially if they're now talking about exascale computers with a million nodes and each node has a thousand cores and nobody knows how to write software for these behemoths. Uh, but I suspect that uh, this is not the uh, uh, vehicle for writing uh, high performance scientific codes. No, I wouldn't expect people to be, this wouldn't be the first place you would go for that. No. Uh, but I'd be very interested to, to hear about your comparison afterwards if you'd like to, to talk. I should let Tom go. Thanks, Sadie. Yeah, so I, I would look at it as a productivity play to, to make people more productive on multi-core using, using libraries, right? And if you look at the language space, you see that F-sharp is taking the lead in some asynchronous uh, programming primitives, but, but, uh, but generally, you know, what's underneath this, which is underneath uh, Intel's thread building blocks and another of, a number of other libraries is decades of Research, you know, I mean, work stealing scheduling is shown to be very good. So all the, all these platforms that uh, are based on sort of this task parallelism have sort of common roots in sort of their their uh, scheduling algorithms, and uh, and so you can also maybe look at the look at that as a way to think about you know what, um, where the performance envelope is. Okay, so this is a second part, um, and uh, my name is Tom Ball. And I'll be uh, accompanied in presenting by Sebastian Burkhardt and Madame Musavathi. Um, and uh, our focus is uh, going to be a little, a little different, complementary really to, to, uh, to what uh, Aid described. So we've been working with uh, 
two other people who are not here, but I should mention their names, uh, Shaz Kadir in my group also, and Ganesh Gopalakrishnan, who's a professor at the University of Utah, on developing some courseware. Uh, and, and the courseware is for a semester-long co course called Practical Parallel and Concurrent Programming. And this one slide is main, meant to give you the gestalt of what we're after. So when I was growing up, I always liked this, uh, the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I don't know if you remember. There was like a guy in his roller skates like with a spoon eating some peanut butter out of a jar and there was a lady you know, with a chocolate bar and the chocolate and the peanut butter got, to, got together and, and they were better. So, so when people say, well, why are you doing parallel and concurrent? Um, I have two answers, it's P and C. It's parallel and concurrent because um, parallelism is about you know, getting speed up by taking inherent uh, t taking use of the resources we have as a machine, the multi-core. Um, and concurrency is, is really about dealing with all these streams of events coming in from the environment. So that's a, a different form of parallelism. It's, um, and, and, and really, if, whether you're in a graphical user interface or a web application um, or a server, you're dealing with both, both concerns, really. So we think that except for you know, small kernels where you're really optimizing some numerical method or scientific computation, most applications people are writing uh, have both aspects of parallels, parallelism and concurrency. And the other reason we talk about PNC is because we do a lot of work on correctness. And so we have parallelism and concurrency, but we also have goals of performance and correctness. So when we think of parallelism, we're thinking of utilizing the underlying fabric, the resources of the machine to speed up uh, our, uh, our application. And we use concurrency as a structuring mechanism to get responsiveness, to do, reduce latency. But when we do all this coding to take advantage of, of parallel resources and to deal with uh, uh, um, parallelism in the environment. We underlying both is correctness. So we don't want to sacrifice correctness uh, just to get speed. Or if we are sacrificing correctness, we should know in which ways we're making that sacrifice. So underlying, sort of, in unifying our, our view of sort of uh, this space is, you know, what are the correctness concepts? And this is again something where there's been decades of research uh, and lots of different terms. And so the, the goal of this course is really a, a breadth course. Uh, for teaching parallelism and concurrency at a high level with unifying concepts to really get across the ideas of correctness and in, in a way that shows how um, uh, these different uh, uh, problem spaces are really united in, in, uh, in notions of uh, correctness concepts. So the focus is, you know, um, we want to speed things up, we want to be more, uh, we want to get speed and responsiveness, but we want, to, we want it to be correct too. Um, so that's, that's the basic take of, of the high level take of the course. Um, this is not quite in order, but who is sort of uh, beginning graduates or senior undergraduates, somebody who's got OO programming, a basic operating systems course, data structures under their belt. Um, what we're delivering is 16 weeks of material divided into eight units um, with slides, notes, exercises, quizzes, sample programs, applications, and as you'll see, a bunch of test and tool technology uh, to look at correctness. We are working on top of .NET 4, um, so the examples, uh, uh, the sample programs and applications are on .NET 4 written in both C Sharp uh, uh, and F Sharp and F Sharp languages. Uh, the units uh, that we have now uh, are, are eight units, and we actually have slides uh, up on the web um, did I give the URL? I can't even remember if it flashed up there already. It was on the top. Yeah, it was on the top. So if you go to this URL, uh, ppcp, research.microsoft.com, ppcp, parallel, practical parallel and concurrent programming, you'll see drafts of the slides. So we're getting that stuff out this summer. Uh, our goal is in September, we'll have the draft materials. We'll do a first iteration ourselves. People are welcome to take the draft materials, teach units. It's going to be ready for your comment uh, in September. You can use the material as much as you like. We're gonna have January as sort of our, uh, th so if September's our beta, January will be sort of our full release with all the polish after going one uh, through one iteration of, of teaching it our, ourselves and getting, and getting feedback. So this is really your time to give us feedback about the material we have, what's missing, what you'd like to see that's not there, uh, um, to try out this, the examples, uh, to look at the tools and the, uh, the exercises 
and all that that we have there. Um, these are the units. I'm not going to go into detail there. You can see more detail about it uh, on the web. As I said, we're covering sort of a breadth of, of, of uh, different uh, topics. The focus is really uh, on the multi-core, uh, but you see we do touch on message passing as a, as a paradigm, and we see even for multi-core that people talk about message passing uh, for massively multi-core. Um, as, a, as, a, as a fundamental paradigm. So we are, we are actually doing quite, covering a, a lot of bases here. Um, so it's not a depth about how to get performance on a particular architecture, um, but we are gonna touch sort of um, uh, data parallel programming as Aid mentioned, different approaches to shared memory, um, synchronization, um, isolation. Uh, we are going to focus also on providing components that have to be written in a concurrent space. It's not always the case that we're writing on top of something that parallelizes for us, but often we need to put, create a new component that is going to execute in a concurrent setting, and we need to know how to do that. Uh, functional approaches are, are very big now. Uh, you heard about MapReduce. We have a P-Link, which is a parallel version of Link. F-Sharp has uh, uh, asynchronous support. We also have something called Accelerator from Microsoft Research, which is data parallel programming on the GPU. Um, so we have, a, we have a bunch of uh, uh, good topics, and believe me, there are threads uh, of ideas that come through this and a lot of good connections that we're making um, to, to, to make this into a pretty cohesive package, but also one where you can, you can take some units out and uh, teach those separately. Um, as I said, we've, we've been working a lot on uh, concurrency, correctness, uh, the, uh, the chess project, uh, which has been around for what, three to four years now, um, uh, is out there and we are making a use of it in the project as our sort of a test technology. Um, the other good thing is that we are making the uh, source code of it and all the things we do for the course available. Uh, what that means is that students who want to use chess will just get the binary release, but if you're doing a research course and you want to do additions uh, to chess uh, to, to add new types of checking, to the testing technology that we provide, you'll have access to the source code. So this will be uh, nice for more research-oriented courses. Um, there's a lot of papers about, about chess that describe its uh, capabilities um, and some new ones uh, and uh, capabilities including data race detection and uh, other types of checking that we think are, are very, very relevant. Uh, in, in fact, almost required if you're taking this library-based approach. Uh, when you're asking people to program uh, concurrency and parallelism using these libraries where they're creating code and it's being uh, parallelized in some sense automatically for them, they have to know very much about race conditions, about uh, making sure that their code is race free. And uh, the tools that we're providing and the examples will have essentially little tests. So, and the first thing we, you know, we want people to do is when they run a program, you know, for example, make sure no races, no interference on parallel for loops, for example. Okay, and that's getting a little bit ahead of myself, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, the rest, to Sebastian and Madan, to, to really just highlight some of the correctness concepts that, that we're gonna be featuring in the course, uh, to tell you about, Sebastian will tell you about the uh, notion of data, phrase, data race free discipline, and, and then uh, Madan will talk uh, about automate, automated linearizability checking. Uh, both these technologies, these ideas, these concepts are supported by the chess tooling and will be featured in the course. So with that, I'll uh, give it over to Sebastian. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about data races. And uh, the reason why I'm talking about this is, although this is a well-known concept, there have been developments within the last five years or so that I think are important, and I wanna cover sort of what aspects of data races are important for our class. So there are two things really I wanna talk about. One is the data race free discipline, which is a, a, a safe way of programming that av avoids many issues. And the second part is just a little bit of background on happens before race detection, which uh, is standard really at this point in time. So I think there are two main things to know about data races. Uh, why, why do we care about data races? So the, very, the first one that we know, and this is where data races were classically introduced, is to find mistakes in, in concurrent or parallel programs. 
And uh, the, the truth is that, you know, many, the, the beauty is many different kinds of mistakes can manifest as data races. And if you have a data race caused by one of these mistakes, it can be very simple to find and fix it. So this is the beauty of, of a data race versus many other kinds of bugs where, um, you know, you, ha you may have some state corruption that requires a complicated schedule to produce. In the terms of the data race, um, it, it's a very easy um, to see where, how it's happening. It's very clearly defined. And uh, the ability to find a bug quickly, report it simply and, and fix it quickly is, is so important that we believe we should work on, on this notion of data race to make it useful as a debugging tool um, for concurrent programs. And uh, the other very big reasons why, why data races are important um, is uh, because of memory model relaxation. So there's this entire research on relaxed memory models and all of this is, um, you, all programmers are completely exposed to that as they use multi-cores and still many programmers don't know about this. And for the purposes of the class, we actually want to keep it that way. We don't want to have to explain exactly what's going on in the memory model. And data races are a way to keep the memory model out of the discussion, which is actually what we want to do. Even though we're personally very interested in relaxed memory models, we kind of want to keep it out of, of this class as much as possible. So um, data races are, have a long history and there are many definitions. And originally often, uh, you know, in order to build various debugging tools, people defined data race just in a way that matched their tool. And uh, for example, classically, or many people still think that data races mean that any shared variables have to be protected by a lock, and many static race detection tools still operate on that basis. Um, the, the terminology is often unclear, even though the, the word race is very evocative, so you can imagine what it means. There are several threads or processes, you know, trying to, to do something, and there is some kind of arbitration going on. But um, we want to know more precisely what it is. So unclear terminology is at fault often. For example, you have races versus data races. Uh, sometimes you have terms like ordered by synchronization, and then you have to say what is synchronization. But the, the good news is that recently there actually has been some, some kind of a convergence in these definitions, and that's caused really by research on memory models. So people who have researched memory models both for managed languages like Java or CLR, as well as for low-level languages like C++, have figured out that a, a good way, a simple way to build relaxed memory models that are independent of the hardware is to actually use this term data race in a very precise way and make statements like, if your program is data race free, then it is sequentially consistent. So what's happening now with these new definitions is we can sort of, con although this is, not, this is not completely formal what I'm showing you, but this gives you a good idea on what all of these uh, language level memory models kind of look like. Um, and they're also very similar to the very, some of the very old definitions. So uh, at the simplest, uh, data race is simply uh, two conflicting memory accesses that happen concurrently. And for now you can think of concurrently as simultaneously. You're really not that far off. So here is something where using multiple cores actually make life, makes life easier because now you can explain concurrency as simultaneous and you're, you're almost exactly right with what that means. So, so for now let's say, say simultaneously and they have two conflicting memory accesses. And the conflict is if they both target the same location and they're not both reads. And they're not synchronization operations. So when I said earlier, you know, is it a, is it a data race if, it, if two um, threads try to acquire a lock? No, that is not a data race. So it really has to be data locations that they're trying to access. Um, so I think the big thing now that I want to kind of say is that it's really possible to write programs without data races. And what we want to do in the course is, is sort of encourage or enforce a data race free discipline for programming. What that means is the programs should not have any data races at all. Sometimes people say my program needs to have benign data races or my program has benign data races. But I think the future is to really build languages and compilers where no data races are benign. And uh, already many programmers follow these guidelines, um, but not all of them. And uh, of course, the pushback that I get when I say everybody should write, write data race free programs is, goes along the following lines. So what is the impact? What happens to your program if you don't have data, if you're not allowed to have data races? So 
here are two answers, and one of them is not the right answer. So answer A is, I have to protect everything with locks and must not use lock-free synchronization techniques. So, so this is one thing that people sometimes think they have to do, and there is always immediately there is a pushback. I have to do this efficiently. I can't do this when I have to get a lock for everything. So I will have to use data races. But the real answer, the real answer is of course the second one, where if this goes forward, yes, then you just have to declare where you have your data races. So what that means is if, you're, if you have a memory location where you want to introduce a race, you either have to use a special type for that location, like volatile in Java or atomic in C++, um, or you have to use a special operations like an interlocked access or a compare and swap, which very clearly and obviously declares that you're doing something that is racy, something that, is, that, that involves multiple threads trying to do something where arbitration has to kick in and decide who goes first. And uh, I think an interesting question is, what are the pros and cons of, of using this discipline? So I think a big one is the code is more declarative. So you can, when you scan through your code and you can see different variables, if a variable has type volatile, you immediately know there's something to, tricky going on. Um, it really helps to understand what's going on. Uh, of course, the code is now immune against memory model relaxations, which was the reason why this whole thing was invented, but it's not even the main reason at this point, I believe. Um, a, a, big, a big point here is all data races are now bugs, right? Because if you say you have to declare it every time you find a data race, there is a, there's really an action you have to take. You have to either fix your bug if it's a real bug or you have to declare it. But there's no such thing as a benign race. And that, that I think is a big, big plus for data race detection because that is now one of the biggest wastes of time is when people try to reason that a certain race is benign. That's where time is really lost. Um, now, there are also cons. So you have to learn how to use these type qualifiers. There is some annotation overhead, although I, I, would, I don't believe this will be much. And finally, a big reason, which is a bit of a problem where research, I think, has to do more work, is that some of these qualifiers may not be efficiently implementable on sound platforms. So there is this research question of what types do we need and what kind of accesses do we need. So now this was the first part. Now I go to a quick second part on uh, how do we actually find the data races. And this is just classic happens before detection, uh, which is what we are doing right now. But there are different ways to do this. So uh, the key idea here is uh, if you actually want to catch the data race happening in the sense that you want to find an execution where those two accesses that conflict happen simultaneously, that may be very difficult, right? Because the, the schedules are probabilistic depending on what the operating system scheduler does and it may be very unlikely that they can actually manifest. So in order to, to have a better probability to find them, uh, you can use something like a happens before race detector where you check for logical concurrency actu rather than actual simultaneous execution. So the way this works is you use logical clocks and you timestamp uh, your accesses and I think I'll, I'll do this quickly. I'm probably getting close to the end of my time. But um, the key idea here is, and this is an old idea. This goes back to vector clocks by Lamport. So you maintain a vector clock, um, which means each thread has its own logical time, which advances as it, as it performs local operation. And whenever there is some kind of communication or synchronization going on, you update the, the latest clock value you have seen from other threads in your local uh, vector that you maintain. And uh, that way you have a, qu a relatively quick way to determine for any two events whether they're logically concurrent. Um, and this way is then independent of exactly how they're physically scheduled. So uh, the, the cool part here is that th even though this was invented for distributed systems, it actually applies nicely to shared memory systems where uh, the sending and receiving of, met of messages, for example, can be replaced by writing and reading of synchronization variables. And uh, so, for example, if you have an execution where the, the thread on the left is uh, setting, writing some data value, setting some flag to indicate that it's done, and then the, the thread on the right waits for this flag to be set and then reads it. Uh, so, so this is an example where, you know, doing doing lock set based race detection would not work. 
But if you do happens before race detection, then you get correctly this um, not reported as the race. So this is actually the setting of the flag and the reading of the flag counts as a synchronization operation. And because but the, the fact that it is in synchronization is represented by the fact that you get an arrow uh, between those events. Okay, so I think that's as much as I want to talk about this for now. Um, are there any questions related to the data race uh, topic? Yes? I hate to ask you all the questions, but okay. uh, there are some people experimenting with uh, languages which do not permit uh, data races. Uh, yes. A colleague of mine at Columbia, Stephen Edwards, says a language called CHIM based on CON networks. Uh, yes. It's for embedded systems, but yes. it, you can't write programs with data races. So from that perspective, uh, I think he would agree with your uh, uh, yes. motivation. Right. So. There's definitely, if you restrict the language, um, you can get a lot of good properties. So I think what I'm trying to say here is that we can make your the programs data, we can require them to be data race free without putting you into a cage uh, of, of a certain way of expressing your algorithm. Because I think there are always going to be algorithms that cannot be efficiently expressed if you stick to one of these clean, very restrictive uh, frameworks. Hi everybody, so uh, I'm Madan Musawati, and today I'm gonna to be talking about um, automated linearizability checking. And this is joint work with Sebastian, my colleague, and uh, two other smart testers at Microsoft, Chris Dunn and Roy Tan. So the interesting thing about this work was actually, uh, the core of this work started when Chris and Roy, they, they actually uh, wanted to solve a real problem and they figured out a way to use chess in an innovative way and they told us about it and then you know we actually generalized the work and then uh, you know it turned out to be an interesting research topic for us. So here's a problem that we have. So let's say you implemented um, um, a concurrent queue, right? This is just the first three columns. It keeps going, right? Even a simple thing like a queue, if you want to implement if you want to have an efficient concurrent queue implementation, it gets very complicated. And you can stare at this for quite some time and convince yourself it's correct, but you know, it's actually a good idea to, um, you know, to write some tests. So let's say um, this is what you're going to do. Since it's a concurrent queue, you obviously want to write a concurrent test. So you created a concurrent queue, and then you created two threads. One is going to push 10, another one is going to pop something. Now, um, you can actually give this and then uh, give this to chess and you know, run this test, and then we'll find like you know, data races, we can find uh, null pointed data references and so on. But there's actually one thing which is not um, you know, fitting very well in this picture is that you know, you're testing a queue and you don't have any assertions that are specific to the queue, right? So what you want to do is like you want to like, you know, after the test is finished, you want to write some assertions that are specific to the queue. So in this case, let's say you, know, you did a you did a push and a pop, so you might think that, you know, uh, okay, the, the queue is going to be empty at the very end. But that's not exactly true because, you know, the pop can fail, so if it happens before the push. And so the size is, like, is either zero or one, right? In the same way, you also want to say that, you know, the return value of pop, you either got a failure value or t is actually 10. But, you know, if you can actually make this assertion a little bit more stronger, and the right value is this that you know, either t failed, in which case the size is one, and if you did a peak on the queue, you'll get 10, or you actually uh, received 10, the return value of pop was 10, and the size is actually zero. So even for this very simple test, you can see that the assertion gets a little bit more complicated. Now let's write a slightly more complicated test. So you have two threads, one is pushing and then popping. Another thread is actually pushing a different value and then popping, right? So now you can see there are two pushes and two pops, so you might think that, you know, oh, maybe the, the, the final state is going to be either zero, the size is going to be either zero, one, or two, but actually it turns out if you stare at this long enough that um, you can actually show that none of the pop, the both pops cannot fail. So the final state has to be, like, you know, uh, you have to end up in a state where the size is zero, and then, you know, there are some constraints on T and U. But my whole point is that even for this very simple test, you know, you can see the assertions are getting complicated, and, you know, you really have to think hard as to see what these assertions are. 
Now, let's say you have this test, right? Now, you can see that, you know, it, this writing the assertion for this test gets just completely out of whack. Now, uh, if you're a tester for this code, a concurrent queue is gonna have around 20 different functions, so you obviously want to write tests that call all of them. And also a real implementation is gonna have these magic numbers, right? When you insert the 257th element, it's gonna behave differently, so your test should be that long enough. So you're writing these huge tests, and you really don't know what the assertion is going to be at the very end, right? Now, um, in fact, this was a real problem in practice. Like for, for code which was this big, you know, people used to write this much of tests, and then for these tests, you know, you had like these many assertions just to make sure the test did the right thing. And uh, we actually wanted to come up with a simpler way. So wouldn't it be nice if you could just, by magic, just say that, you know, everything behaves like it should, right? Like in this case, the concurrent queue actually behaves like a queue. Now, this looks like a circular thing, right? Now, I'm assuming that everything behaves like a queue. I haven't told you exactly what the queue is. And informally, this is exactly what people say when they mean threat safety. Like, for instance, if you look at the, what the definition of threat safety, you know, you go to Wikipedia, like, you know, it says a like, piece of code is threat safe if it functions correctly during simultaneous execution of multiple threads. So in effect, you have essentially said something circular, right? Threats, something is threat safe if it is safe. Um, and you know, it's actually, it's not, it's actually very difficult to pin down exactly what you mean by threat safety. And our take is that when uh, you say threat safety, actually you're thinking about this correctness notion that early and Wink came in 1990, which is called linearizability. For example, when I gave you the example of this queue and you were trying to fill out what the assertion should be, your brain was actually thinking about linearizability, even though you didn't think about it. So uh, let's say what linearizability is. So first, you uh, take a queue and then you actually specify exactly what you mean by a queue. This is your you know, tr traditional definition of what a queue is. Like if you push something, it behaves like a P PFO and so on. So let's say you have a sequential specification and then you have to figure out what behaves like is. So what you do is that you take concurrent behaviors of the, queue, of the class and then make sure that every concurrent behavior is consistent with the sequential specification where consistency is defined as follows. Like, you know, every concurrent behavior, it looks as if each op uh, operation appears co uh, to occur atomically at some point between the begin and end. So this is actually the, the definition of linearizability. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the details and the intricacies of this, but, you know, I just wanted to make a claim that when you think about threat safety, you're actually thinking about linearizability. So, um, so the, for, to, to solve this problem, so at the very end, you just want to say, this behavior that my test saw was actually linearizable with respect to a specification of a queue. So the change that we have, the trick that we got is that you know, we got away without uh, having to specify the specification. So, um, so our assumption was that by the time you start writing concurrency tests, you have written enough sequential tests so that your program is sequentially correct. So the sequential specification is already embodied in the code. So what we will check is that given the code, we'll just check if there exists some deterministic specification with, uh, with respect to which your class is actually linear linearizable. And the way we do it is that, you know, you give us the code and then we'll automatically synthesize the sequential specification. So we'll take your class, we'll try a push and say, oh, a push always succeeds on an empty queue. And then if you did a pop, huh, pop, Pop seems to return 10, and so we can actually, you know, automatically infer what a queue is doing by actually calling uh, the operations in the, uh, to the class. And so by observing the sequential behaviors, we actually synthesize a spec, and then we automatically check linearizability with respect to the spec. And we actually have some proofs uh, which show that, you know, we are complete. So when our tool fails, then we can show that your component is not linearizable with respect to any deterministic specification. And um, you know, we actually need this extra constraint about that you know, you're not allowed to write non-deterministic specifications because you know, there's no way to do it automatically. Because any program is, is linearizable with respect to the non-deterministic specification that allows all behaviors. So that's why we had to put this restriction. And we also have some restricted soundness. What this means is that if your component is not linearizable, then it, there exists a test case for which a lineup will fail. And um, you know, since we are a dynamic analysis tool, uh, we will not be able to give be sound, you know, unless, um, you know, we cannot be complete and sound at the same time. 
So um, one of the points that I wanted to bring up here is, you know, I really wanted to get feedback about what you thought when, when you're thinking about threat safety. And uh, so one of the things that we found out was that it, you actually had to generalize this notion of linearizability a little bit in order to make your proofs go through and actually make a, make a tool work. And so one of the things was that linearizability does not actually define um, the correct blocking behavior. So one trivial way to make all uh, your, your class linearizable is to make it block on all operations. So vacuously it will not have any concurrent behavior and so it's obviously linearizable. So we actually had to tighten the check a little bit to make sure that uh, we can actually check more general operations. But the interesting question is like, now what does it mean for something like a web server to be threat safe? What does it mean for an operating system to be threat safe? And those are really interesting questions and it'll be interesting to see if this notion of linearizability can actually be extended um, for those uh, kind of applications. So um, that's all I had for today. So I'll take any questions. Thank you. Oh, one more slide. I just, sorry, okay. I just wanted the chance to, to wrap up and uh, thanks Sebastian and Madan. Um, and to tell you again, uh, please, uh, we'd love for you to give us your feedback about, about the course. Remember it's research.microsoft.com slash PPCP. And you can find draft slides up there already. And, and again, um, uh, the, the slide that tells you sort of our, our high level overview. And, and yeah, we're lo looking for uh, all sorts of feedback and also users of the material, whether it's a single unit, two units, or you want to try the whole thing out. engineering has very little concept about performance, about what constitutes performance, measuring performance uh, issues. So uh, what I found was before we have to go into parallelism, which is more about performance, you have to get the basics of performance, understand memory system issues and things like that. So where do you see your course fitting in for somebody who has taken a vanilla software engineering courses that they learn to abstract out all the performance issues. Right, so we, we, are, we actually have some tooling and concepts in the course around performance. So we start with basic data parallelism and we talk about work and span. Okay, so we, we talk about Amdahl's law and we talk about work and span and we talk about the sequential part of your computation. Uh, then as we, we, and we provide tools for you to see sort of when you have these tasks, you know, how much uh, um, you know, blocking is there and, and, and you can sort of see, oh, you know, I parallelized this thing, but, but it's not very efficient. Uh, then the question I think becomes, you know, what about the memory hierarchy, memory bottlenecks, false sharing? And we, we do have material sprinkled throughout uh, uh, as we get to, for example, nested data parallelism um, and we start to have maybe some caching issues or, you know, we, we don't see a speed up, we see a slowdown. So I, th I think, you know, we do have, a, we emphasize the correctness here because that's sort of where our expertise is. We are in, in the units putting, putting stuff on performance, but it's not a deep, it's not a deep dive. Hi Tom, uh, uh, this is very nice. I was just curious, uh, what kind of examples do you do you have in mind to go through the, with the? I mean, application examples do you have in mind to go through with the students? So right. So so right now, we don't have a lot of resources to build like new applications. So what we're starting with is a bunch of uh, a bunch of small applications that come with the parallel extensions, uh, the .NET 4.0. So there's freely available source code up on CodePlex with uh, small examples. Uh, and 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 just to, uh, to to applications that do things like searching your file system, you know. Um, I mean, we wouldn't call maybe these things little utilities, right? So we're starting we're starting off uh, with sort of uh, we have a bunch of pedagogical examples that here's a parallel for loop, here's a parallel for loop with a race, here's a parallel for loop with too much locking, and things like that. So we have the pedagogical examples, which are your tiny toy benchmarks to demonstrate. Uh, concepts and then we are, are are basically pulling right now uh, from uh, 
from the uh, examples that come with the .NET 4 framework. Uh, as, we, as we advance and actually do iterate the course, we'll, 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 try, and build, we'll try and build some more uh, substantial things. But we are thinking about uh, you know, data processing on the multi-core. So we wanna have like data processing examples. We wanna have examples where you have live, live feeds from the web, like what Aid showed, where you need to coordinate sort of live feeds coming in, maybe doing querying against the database. Uh, and we also wanna look at interactivity, you know, where you have a graphical user interface, where you have to be very interactive, but at the same time, you may be using the multi-core multi -core to get speed up on image processing, things like that. Um, so that, that's sort of a, uh, a class of uh, examples. make a closing remark. So that's some of the impetus that is coming out of a combination of the three groups, external research, research, and the product group, to try to uh, get the, uh, the parallel and the concurrency ideas more out into the universities. And so it's, it's, it would be great if just a few of you even could speak to us about it. If you're planning on doing these courses, we're happy to partner with you. Thanks. Thank you to the speakers.